Hello and welcome to this second second look at uh, it's, it's the second session of our second look sessions on uh, Thomas of Woodstock, this most fabulous of plays. Today we are looking at Act 3 uh, through to Act 4, Scene 1. If you'd like to know the story so far, uh, go back to the previous video where we ran Act 1 and 2 at pace. And that's what we do with the second look. Uh, we've already done a slow burn first look. We've done some workshops on this play. We think it's fabulous. This is a, 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 a look at the play where we run at it with a bit more pace, get a sense mm. of the flow as much as you can when you have to split the play across several sessions uh, because it's of its enormous length. It's, it is a long play uh, and we don't even have the end. Um, so uh, yeah, this is all about throwing more ideas into the hat in terms of how to perform it. We're not necessarily here with answers. We may um, uh, still be just throwing our performances out there uh, and seeing what sticks and what does not not um and uh that some of the people in the room are professional actors some are not uh we're all just having a bit of fun at the end of a long year of uh, of looking at plays and uh, hopefully some of this is going to be useful for you it's definitely going to be useful for us as we work towards uh fuller uh performance versions of this in the future reading today uh we have a, a discontinuity in king richard's uh, across the week uh whereas many of the other parts uh, remain the same richard is passed from actor to actor uh, so uh, regenerating today into Richard II and also playing a schoolmaster is... Hello, I'm Valentina and I am an Italian actor and voiceover artist in London. And continuing uh, the uh, uh, the viciousness of green as well as being a, a courtier and a whistler is... I don't know what you mean about viciousness, Robert. I'm a paragon of virtue and I am Liza Graham, actor, singer and Renaissance text coach, two actors in London. Of course, I'm personally biased, uh, and I, I consider uh, uh, the other characters like Bagot and also Crosby to be caterpillars, and reading uh, Bagot and uh, Crosby is... Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor from Montpellier, France, and yes, Woodstock is just jealous of us. Uh, similarly uh, uh, dangerous to the state of the nation, uh, reading Bushy and Butcher is... <laughs> Hello, I, I, I don't think I'll defend my character. My name is Lynn. I'm a writing teacher. I live in the Northwestern United States. And if we continue down that line of reprobates, we have Tressilian as also Cowtail, read by... Alexandra, and today I'm all about that continuity. And uh, also reading Nimble, and, and also uh, 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 we're really looking forward to this because it's vital to Act 3. Uh, also playing the horse is... Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director living in Germany, and I'm really excited about playing the horse. Mm. Uh, we are not horsing around here, people. We are not. Um, reading uh, the wife of Richard II, Queen Anne, also playing various servants, serving men, etc. is... Hi, I'm Tamara, and I am just glad I'm not part of the mean girl troop in here. <laughs> Um, on the uh, on the other side of the fence, as it were, uh, of the uncles of Richard II, we have uh, reading Lancaster as well as Ignorance later is... Hello, I'm Helen Good, I'm a historian and I'm in Hull. Reading another brother, uh, uncle, uh, York and a farmer is... Hello, I'm Alan Scott, based in Suffolk, neither an actor nor an academic. Uh, reading Cheney is... Hello, I'm Lois, based in London, one of the dreaded academics. And uh, reading, and this is uh, a swap from uh, previous session, reading Scroop and also Fleming is... Hello, my name's Francis Cox. I'm an actor, British actor, living in Amsterdam. And I am your host, Robert Crichton, and today I will be reading uh, Thomas of Woodstock himself because it's the end of the year and I get to let myself off the lead a little bit. Um, and uh, that is the company, I think. I don't think I've missed anyone for today's session. And so looking at Act 3 uh, to scene uh, uh, for one uh, today. So uh, a reasonable middle third of the text. Uh, and uh, so all I'm going to do now is uh, ask ask those who are not on stage to clear themselves because we are now going to enter the <clears throat> court of King Richard II and get a sense of what's going on there. So take a moment and enter King Richard 
Bagot, Bushy Green, and Scroop, and Tresillion. Come, my Tresillion. Thus, like an emperor, shall King Richard reign, and you, so many kings, attendant on him. Our guard, the virtues, keep the doors, I charge ye. Let no man enter to disturb our pleasures. Thou tools me, Cantrasilian, thou hast devised blank charters to fill up our treasury, opening the chests of hoarding cormorants that laugh to see their kingly sovereign luck. Let's know the means. We may applaud the wit. See here, my lord, only with parchment, innocent sheepskins. Yet, uh, see, here's no fraud. No claws, no deceit in the writing. Hmm. Why? Why? There's nothing in it! There's the trick on it! These blank charters shall forthwith be sent to every shreve through all the shires of England with charge to call before them presently all landed men, freeholders, farmers, graziers, or any else that have ability. Then, in your highness' name, they shall be charged to set their names and forthwith seal these blanks. That done, these ah. shall return to court again, but cartloads of money soon shall follow them. Excellent, Tresillian. Noble Lord Chief Justice. Where should his grace get such a counsellor? Not, not if his beard were off. Uh, prithee, Tresillian, off with it. So what thou seest, we have not a beard among us. Thou sendst out barbers there to pull the whole country. So what, let some shave thee. Twould, be be twould become thee better in faith and make thee look more grim when thou sittest in judgment. I tell you, gallants, I will not lose a hair of my lordship and King Richard's favour for the Pope's revenues. <laughs> By your leave there, give way to the Queen. Ah, now, Anna Beam, how cheers my dearest Queen? Is it holiday, my love? Believe me, lords, tis strange to take her from the sensory. She and her maids are all for housewifery. Shalt work no more, sweet nan. Thou King's Richard's King. And peer and people shall stoop to him. We'll have no more protecting uncles, trust me. Pretty, look smooth, and bid these nobles welcome. Whom my lord favours must to me be welcome. These are counsellors, I tell ye, lady, and these shall better grace King Richard's court than all the doting heads that late controlled us. Thou seest already we begin to alter the vulgar fashions of our homespun kingdom. I tell thee, Nan, the states of Christendom shall wonder at our English royalty. We held a council to devise these suits. Sir Henry Green devised this fashion she. Boshy, this pick, Bagoton's group set forth this kind coherence twixt the toe and knee, we have them chained together lovingly, and we as sovereign did confirm them all. Suit they not quaintly, Nan? So, Queen, resolve me. I see no fault that I dare call a fault, but would your grace consider with advice what you have done unto your reverend uncles? My fears provoke me to be bold, my lord. They are your noble kinsmen. To revoke the sentence were... An act of folly, then. King's words are laws. If we infringe our word, we break our, our law. No more of them, sweet queen. Madam, what's done was with advice enough. The king is now at years and hath shook off the servile yoke of mean protectorship. His highness can direct himself sufficient. Why should his pleasures then be curbed by any, as if he did not understand his state? They tell thee true, sweet love. Come, ride with me, and see today my hall at Westminster, which we have builded now to feast our friends. Do, do, good madam, prithee, sweet king, let's ride some whither, and it be but to show ourselves. Sfoot, our devices here are like jewels kept in a casket, or good faces in masks that grace not the owners because they're obscured. If our fashions be not published, what glories in the wearing? We'll ride through London only to be gazed at. Fair Anna Beam, you shall along with us. At Westminster you shall see my sumptuous hall, my royal tables richly 
furnished, where every day I feast 10,000 men to furnish out which feast I daily spend 30 fat oxen and 300 sheep with fish and fowl in numbers numberless. Not all our chronicles shall point a king to match our bounty, state and royalty, or let successors yet to come strive to exceed me. And, if they forbid it, let records say, only King Richard did it. Oh, but, my lord, twill tire your revenues to keep this festival a year together. As many days as I write England's king, we will maintain that bounteous festival. Tresillian! Look to your blank charters speedily, send them abroad with trusty officers, and Bagot, see a messenger be sent to call our uncle Woodstock home to the court. Not that we love his meddling company, but that the raged commons loves his plainness and should grow mutinous about these blanks, we'll have him near us. Within his arrow's length we stand secure. We can restrain his strength, see it be done. Come in to our great hall where Richards keep his gorgeous festival. Within there. Ho! Your Lordship's pleasure. What are those blanks dispatched? They're all trussed up, my Lord, in several packets. Where's Nimble? Where's that varlet? As nimble as a Morris dancer. Now my bells are on. How do you like the rattling of my chains, my oh, lord? Villain, thou wilt hang in chains for this. Art thou crept into the court fashion, knave? Yes, my lord. Ye know I have followed your lordship without e'er a rag since ye ran away from the court once. And mm. I pray, let me follow the fashion a little to show myself a courtier? Go uh, spread those several bl blanks throughout the kingdom and here's commission with the council's hand uh, to assist and aid you. And when they're sealed and signed, uh, see ye note well such men's ability as set their hands to them. Inquire what rents, what lands or what revenues they spent by the year and let me straight receive intelligence. Besides, I'd have you use yourselves so cunningly to mark whose grudges, who, who grudges, or who, but speaks amiss of good King Richard, myself, or any of his new counsellors. Attach them all for privy whisperers and send them up. How the trick in law shall make King Richard seize into his hands the forfeiture of all their goods and lands. Uh, Nimble, take thou these blanks and see you take a special note of them. I'll take the ditty, sir, but you shall set a note to it, for if any man shall speak but an ill word of anything that's written here... <laughs> Why, as there's nothing. And would ye have them speak ill of nothing? That's strange. But I mean, my lord, if they should but give this paper an ill word, as to say, I will tear this paper, or worse, I will rend this paper, or fouler words than that, as to say, I will bum fiddle your paper. If there be any such, I have a black book for them, my lord, I warrant ye. Mm. Be it your greatest care to be severe. Crosby and Fleming, pray be diligent. We shall, my lord. But how if we meet with some ignoramus fellows, my lord, that cannot write their minds what shall they do if they but set their marks it is good we shall meddle with no women in the blanks shall we rich widows none else for a widow is as much as man and wife well, then a widow's a hermaphrodite <laughs> both cut and long tail and if she cannot write she shall set her mark to it hmm. what else sir but if she have a daughter, she shall set her mother's mark to it? A meddle with none but men and widows, I charge ye. Well, sir, I shall see a widow's mark then. And I saw one yet. You have your lessons perfect. Now, be gone, be bold, and swift in execution. God by ye, my lord. Hmm. We will domineer over the vulgar like so many St. George's over the poor dragons. Come, sirs, 
We all like to have a flourishing Commonwealth, see face. <sighs> come, come, my good brothers. Here at Plashy House, I'll bid you welcome with us, true our heart, as Richard with a false and mind corrupt, disgraced our names and thrust us from his court. Beshrew him that repines, my lord. For me, I lived with care at court. I now am free. Come, um, come, let's find some other talk. I think not on it. I ne'er slept soundly when I was amongst them. So let them go. This house of plushy brother stands in a sweet and pleasant air of faith. It is near the Thames and circled round with trees that in the summer serve for pleasant fans to cool ye, and in winter strongly break the storm winds that else would nip ye too. And in faith, old York, we have all need of some kind wintering. We are beset, heaven shield, with so many storms, and yet these trees at length will prove to me like Richard and his riotous minions. Oh, their wanton heads so oft play with the winds, throwing their leaves so prodigally down, they'll leave me cold at last. And so will they make England wretched, and in the end themselves. If Westminster Hall devour as it has begun, Twere better it were ruined, lime and stone. <laughs> For my God, I late was certified that at one feast was served 10,000 dishes. The daily feasts, they say, 10,000 men. And every man must have his dish at least. Oh, 30 fat oxen and 300 sheep serve but one day's expense. A hundred scarcely can suffice his guard. Camp of soldiers feeds not like those bowmen. But how will these expenses be maintained? Oh, they say there are strange tricks come forth to fetch in money. What they are, I know not. Uh, you've heard of the fantastic suits they wear. Never was English king so habited. Oh, we could allow his clothing, Brother Woodstock. <laughs> But we have four kings more equaled with him. There's Bagot, Bushy, mm. Wanton Green, and Scroop, in state and fashion without difference. Indeed, they're more than kings, but they rule him. Ah, oh, come, come, our breaths reverberate the wind. We talk like good divines, but cannot cure the grossness of the sin. Or shall, or shall we speak like all commanding wise astronomers and flatly say, such a day shall be fair. And yet it rains, whether he will or no. So may we talk, but thus will Richard do. Ah. How now, Cheney? What drives thee on so fast? Uh, if I durst, I would say my Lord Tresillian drives me on. <laughs> Half as ill, I'm still the pursuivant of unhappy news. Here's blank charters, my Lord. Uh, I pray, uh, behold them. Sent from King Richard and his counsellors. Thou makest me blank at very sight of them. What, what must these? They appear in shape of obligations. They are no less. The country's full of them. Commissions are come down to every shreve to force the richest subjects of the land to set their hands and forthwith seal these blanks. And then the bond must afterwards be paid that shall confirm a due debt to the king as much or a little as they please to point it. Oh, strange unheard of vile taxation. Who is can help my memory a little? Uh, has not this air been held a principle that nothing spoke or done that has not been? It was a maxim ere I had appeared. Oh, Tis now found false. An open heresy. This is a thing was never spoke nor done. Blank charters call ye them. Oh, if any age could keep but a record of this policy. Or I, I, I phrase it too well. Flat villainy. Let me be chronicled, uh, apostasy, <laughs> rebellious to my God and country both. 
How do the people entertain these blanks? <laughs> With much dislike. Yet some for fear have signed them. Others they be refuse and murmur strangely. Oh, for my God, I cannot blame them for it. He, he might as well have sent defiance to them. Oh, vulture England, wilt thou eat thy own? Can they be rebels called that now turn head? I, I, I speak but what I fear, not, not what I wish. This foul oppression will withdraw all duty and in the common's heart's hot rancors breed to make our country's bosom shortly bleed. What shall we do to seek for remedy? Let each man hie him to his several home before the people rise in mutiny and in the mildest part of lenity seek to restrain them from rebellion. But what else can be looked for? Promise redress. That eloquence is best in this distress. Your counsel's well. Let us haste away. The time is sick. We must not use delay. Let's still confer by letters. Content, content. So friends may parley even in banishment. Farewell, good brothers. Uh, Cheney, conduct them. Oh, a Jew. Good York and Gaunt, farewell forever. I have a sad presage come suddenly that I shall never see these brothers more. On earth I fear we never more shall meet. Of Edward the Third's seven sons, we three are left to see our father's kingdom ruinate. I would my death might end in misery. My fear presageth to my wretched country. The commons will rebel without all question. And for my God, I have no eloquence to stay this uproar. I must tell them plain. We all are struck, but must not strike again. Uh, how now? What news? There's a horseman at the gate, my lord. He comes from the king, he says, to see your grace. To see me, says thou. In God's name, let him come, so he brings no blank charters with him. Prithee, bid him light and enter. I think he dares not for fouling on his feet, my lord. I would have had him light, but he swears he's a courtier. He will not off on horseback till the inner gate be open. Passion of me, that's strange. <laughs> oh, I prithee give him satisfaction. Open the inner gate. What must this fellow be? Some fine fool. He's tied very fantastically and talks as foolishly. Go let him in. And when you have done, bid Cheney come and speak with me. I will, my lord. Come on, sir, ye may ride into my lord's cellar now, and ye will, sir. Uh, prithee, fellow, stay and take my horse. I have business for my lord, sir, I cannot. A rude swain, by heaven, but stay, here walks another. Hearest thou? Fellow, is this plashy house? Uh, ye should have asked that question before you came in, sir, but this is it. The hinds are almost rude and gross. I, I prithee, walk my horse. I have a little business, sir. If thou shalt not lose by it, I'll give thee a tester for thy pains. Oh, I shall be glad to earn money, sir. A prithee, do. And know thy duty, thy head's too saucy. Cry, cry ye mercy, I did not understand your worship's calling. The Duke of Gloucester lies here, does he not? Marry. Does he, sir? Is he within? He's not far off, sir. He was here even now. Ah, very good. Walk my horse well, I prithee. He's travelled hard and he's hot, if faith. I'll in and speak with the Duke and pay thee presently. I make no doubt, sir. <laughs> oh, strange metamorphosis. 
is it possible that this fellow that's all made of fashions should be an Englishman? <laughs> no marvel if he know not me, being so brave and I so beggarly. Well, I will earn money to enrich me now, and tis the first I earned by the rude this forty year. <clears throat> um, come on, sir. You have sweat hard about this haste, uh, yet I think you know little of the business. Come on. Why, so I say. You're a very indifferent beast. You'll follow any man that will lead you. Now, truly, sir, you look but e'en leanly on you feed not in Westminster holidays where so many sheep and oxen are devoured. I'm afraid they'll eat you shortly if you tarry amongst them. <laughs> You're pricked more with the spur than the provender, I see that. Well, I think your dwelling be at Hackney when you're at home, is not? Hmm? <laughs> oh, you know not the Duke neither, no more than your master. And yet I think you have as much wit as he. <laughs> Faith, say a man should steal ye and feed ye fatter. Uh, could ye run away with him lustily? Ah, uh, your silence argues a consent, I see. <laughs> Oh, by the mass, here comes company. If we had both been taken, we had, I see. Uh, saw ye not my lord at the gate, say ye? I, I left him there, but now. In sooth, I saw no creature, sir, only an old groom I got to walk my horse. A groom, say ye? Sweat, tis my lord the duke. What have you done? This is somewhat too coarse. Your grace should be an ostler to this fellow. I do beseech your grace's pardon. The, the error was in the mistake. Your, your plainness did deceive me. Please, it's your grace to, to re-deliver oh, my... Oh, no, by my faith. I'll have my money first. Promise is a debt. <laughs> I, I, I know your grace's goodness will refuse it. Think not so nicely of me. Indeed, I will not. Uh, if you if you so please, <laughs> there's your tester. Ah, ah. Oh, well, if you so please, there is your horse, sir. Now, pray you, uh, tell me, is your haste to me? The most swift and serious from his majesty. What? From King Richard? Oh, my dear lord and kinsman. <laughs> uh, go, Sarah, uh, take you this horse, uh, lead him to the stable, uh, meet him well. I'll uh, double his reward. There's uh, twelve pence for you. I thank your grace. Now, sir, your business. His Majesty commends him to your grace. Oh, the, these saints, a rare fashion you have got at course. Uh, oh, of whose devising was it, I pray? I assure your grace, the king, his council, sat three days about it. Oh, by my faith, their wisdoms took great pains, I assure ye. The state was well employed the, way, the while by the rude. Uh, then um, this at court is all the fashion now. Uh, the king himself doth wear it, whose most gracious majesty sent me in haste. Oh, this, um, this peak doth strangely well become the foot. Mm. Ah, this peak the king doth likewise wear, being a Polonian peak. And me did his highness pick from forth the rest. <laughs> oh, he could not have picked out such another, I assure ye. I thank your grace that picks me out so well. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, his highness would request... But this, he... this most fashionable chain that links, as it were, the toe and the knee together. <gasps> ah, in a most kind coherence, so it like your grace. For these two parts being in operation and quality different as example, the toe a disdainer or spurner, the knee a dutiful and most humble orator. This chain doth, as it were, so 
toeify the knee and so neify the toe that between both it makes a, a most methodical coherence or coherent method. <laughs> It is most excellent, sir, and full of art. Um, but pr please, you uh, walk in. <laughs> uh, my message tendered. I will tend your grace. Oh, uh, oh, oh cry you mercy. Uh, have you a message to me? <clears throat> His majesty, most affectionately and like a royal kinsman, entreats your grace's presence at the court. Is that your message, sir? I must refuse it, then. My English... Plainness will not suit that place. The court's too fine for me. My service here will stand in better stead to quench the fire those blanks have made. I would they all were burnt, or he were hanged that first devised them. Sir, they stir the country so. I dare not come, and so excuse me, sir. If the king think it ill, he thinks amiss. I am plain Thomas still. The rest I'll tell ye as ye sit at meat. Uh, furnish uh, a table, Cheney. Call for wine. Uh, come, sir. Ye shall commend me to the king. Tell him I'll keep these parts in peace to him. Dispatch, good Mr. Bailey. The market's almost done, you see. Tis rumoured that the blanks are come and the rich just begin to flock out the town already. And therefore I charge ye in the king's name, be ready to assist us. Nay, look ye, sir, be not too pestiferous, I beseech thee. I have begun myself, and sealed one of your blanks already. And by my example thus more shall follow. I know my place and calling. My name is Ignorance, and I am Bailey of Dunstable. Ah. I cannot read, write nor read, I confess it. No more could my father, nor his father, nor none of the ignorance this hundred year, I assure ye. Your name proclaims it no less, sir, and it has been a most learned generation. <sighs> oh, I cannot write, I have set my mark. Ek signum, read it, I beseech thee. The mark of Simon Ignorance, the Bailey of Dunstable, being a sheep hook with a tar box at end on it. Very right. It was my mark ever since I was an innocent. And therefore, as I say, I have begun and will assist thee. For here be rich horses in the town, I can tell thee, that will give thee the slip and he look not to it. We therefore presently will divide ourselves. You two shall stay here while we, Master Ignorance, with some of your brethren, the men of Dunstable, walk through the town, noting the carriage of the people. They say there are strange songs and liables cast about the marketplace against my Lord Tresillian and the rest of the King's councillors. If such there be, we'll have some aid and attach them speedily. Oh, ye shall do well, sir, and um, for your better aiding, if you can but find out my brother, Master Ignoramus, he will be most pestiferous unto ye, I assure ye. I'm afraid he will not be found, sir, but we'll inquire. Come, fellow Fleming, and nimble, look to the whisper as I charge ye. I'll warrant ye. Come, Master Bailey. Let your billmen retire till we call them, and you and I will here shadow ourselves and write down their speech. Nay, you shall write, and I will mark, sir. And see, see, here come some already, all rich cubs by the mass. I know them all, sir. Tarry, tarry, good neighbours. Take a knave with ye. What a moraine! Is there a bear broke loose in the town that you make such haste from the market? A bear? No, nor a lion beat it neither. I tell you, neighbour, I am more afraid of the bee than the bear. There's wax to be used today, and I have no seal about me. I may tell you in secret, here's a dangerous world towards. Neighbour, you're a farmer, 
and I hope here's none but God and good company. We live in such a state! I am even almost weary of all, I assure you. Here's my other neighbour, the butcher that dwells at Hockley, has heard his landlord, landlord tell strange tidings. We shall be hoisted and we tarry here, I can tell you. Oh, they begin to murmur. I'll put them down, all the whisperers. Master Bailey, what's he that talks so? His name is Cowtail, a rich grazier that dwells here hard by at Leighton Buzzard. His name Cowtail, a grazier dwelling at Leighton Buzzard, Master Bailey? Right, sir. Listen again, sir. Ah, sirrah, and what said the good knight, your landlord neighbour? Mary, he said, but I'll not stand to anything, I'll tell you that beforehand. He said that King Richard's new counsellors, God amend them, had crept into honester men's places than they themselves were, and that the king's uncles and the old lords were all banished to court, and he said flatly, we should never have a merry world as long as it was so. Butcher, you and your landlord will be both hanged for it. And then he said, there's one Tresillian, a lawyer, who has crept in amongst them and is now a lord for suit. And he's sent down into every country in England a sort of black chapters. Black chapters? In God's name, neighbour, out of what black book were they taken? Come, come, they are blank charters, neighbours. I heard of them afore and therefore I made such haste away. They're sent down to the high shriek with special charge that every man that is of any credit or worship in the country must set their hands and seal to them. For what intent I know not, but I say no more. I smell something. Well, well, my masters, let's be wise. We are not all one man's. They say there are whispering knaves. Let us hire us home, for I assure you, was told me where I broke my fast this afternoon that there are about three score gentlemen in our shire that had set their hands and seals to those blank charters already. No, God, amend them for it. They have given an ill example we shall be forced to follow. I would my wife and children were at Jerusalem with all the wealth. I'd make shift for one, I warrant them. Come, neighbours. Let's be gone. Ah, uh, 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 step forward with your bills, Master Bailey. Not too far, sirs. I charge you in the king's name to stand till we have done with thee. Saint Benedict, hey, what Benedict, must we do now, Trow? No, be not so pestiferous, my good friends and neighbours. You are men of wealth and credit in the country. And therefore, as I myself and others have begun, I charge ye in his highness name presently to set your hands and seal to these blank charters. Jeez, you rescue my soul. I'm departed. I mean, stroke to heart, too. Alas, sir, we are poor men. What should our hands do? But there's no harm in it. I warrant ye. What need you fear when you see Bailey ignorance has sealed before ye? Uh Pray you, let's see them, sir. Here, you bacon-faced pudding eaters. Are you afraid of sheepskin? Our mask is somewhat darkly written. Aye, aye, it was done in the night, sure. Mass, neighbours, there's nothing that I see. And can it be any harm that I have for nothing? These blank charters are but little pieces of parchment. Let's set our marks to them and be rid of the knave's company. As good as first as last. We can but be undone. I, I can our own hands undo us. That's the worst on it. Lend us your pen, sir. We must all venture, neighbours. There's no remedy. They grumble as they do it. I must put them down for whisperers and grumblers. Come, have you done yet? Aye, sir. But you and they were sodden for my swain. Here's wax then, I'll seal them for ye. 
Mm. And you shall severally take them as delivery of your deeds. Well, come your boars, Grease, take this seal here, so. This is your deed. Both, sir. Uh, in some respect it is, and it is not. And this is yours? Aye, uh, sir. Against my will, I swear. Oxjaw, take of this seal. You'll deliver your deed with a good conscience. There it is, sir, against my conscience, God's my witness. I hope you have done with us now, sir. <laughs> No, ye caterpillars, we have worse matters against ye yet. Sarah, you know what your landlord told ye concerning my Lord Tresillian and King Richard's new favourites. And more than that, you know your own speech. And therefore, Master Bailey, let some of your billmen away with them to the High Shreves presently, either to put in bail or be sent up to the court for privy whisperers. Their offences are most pestiferous. No, oh, wait, all, we shall all to hanging, sure. <laughs> hanging? Nay, that's the least on it. You should tell me that a twelve month hence else. Stand close, Master Bailey. We shall catch more of these traitors presently. Oh, you shall find me most pestiferous to assist ye. <laughs> and so I pray ye, commend my service to your good lord and master. Come, sir, stand close, I see. Nay, sweet master, schoolmaster, let's hear it again, I beseech ye. But he enter, you're a serving man, I'm a scholar. I have shown art and learning in these verses, I assure ye. And yet, if they were well searched, they are little better than libels. <laughs> but the carriage of a thing is all. So, I've covered them rarely. This foot, the country's so full of intelligences that two men can scarce walk together, but they're attached for whisperers. This paper shall wipe their noses, and they shall now bow to a goose for it, for I'll have these verses sung to their faces by one of my schoolboys, wherein I'll tickle them all in five. Shall hear else, but first... Let's look, there be no pictures with ears, no noodle needles with eyes about. Hmm? Come, come, all safe. I warrant thee. Mark, then. Here I come over them, for their blank charters shall hear else. Will you buy any parchment knives? We sell for little gain. Where are weary of their lives, they'll rid them of their pain. Blank charters, they are called, a vengeance on the villain. I would he were both flayed and bald. God bless my lord Tresillian. <laughs> it's not fair. Oh, rascals, they're down 300 fathom deep already. Mate, look, you saw. There can be no exception taken for this last line helps all, wherein with any kind of equivocation I say, God bless my Lord Tresillian. Do you mark me, sir? Now, here in the next verse, I run o'er all of them flutterers in the court by name. You shall see close. <clears throat> A poison may be green, but bushy can be not faggot. Good men, the kings, and bless the queen, and tis no matter... For Beggart, for Scroop, he does no good. But if you'll know the villain, his name is now to be understood. God bless my lord Tresillian. <laughs> How like you this, sir? Oh, that is excellent in faith, sir. Ooh. Oh, traitors, Master Bailey, do your authority. Two most pestiferous traitors, lay hold of them, I charge ye. What mean ye, sir? Nay, talk not, for if you had a hundred lives, they were all hanged. Ye have spoken treason in the ninth degree. Treason? Oh, patientia, good sir, we spoke not a word. Be not so pestiferous. Mine ears have heard your examinations wherein you uttered a most shameful treason. For ye said, God bless my Lord Tresillian. Oh, I hope there's no treason in that, sir. That shall be tried. Come, Master Bailey, 
their hands shall be bound under a horse's belly and sent up to him presently. They'll both be hanged, I warrant them. Well, well sir, if we be, we'll speak more ere uh, we be hanged in spite of ye. Aye, aye. When you're hanged, speak what you will, we care not. Away with them! You see, Master Bailey, what knaves are abroad now you are here? It is time to look about, you see? I see there are knaves abroad indeed, sir. I speak for mine own part. I will do my best to reform the pestiferousness of the time. And as, for example, I have set my mark to the charters, so I will set mine eyes to observe these dangerous cases. Close again, Master Bailey. Here comes another whisperer. See by, oh, villain, he whistles treason. I'll lay hold of him myself. Out, alas, what, what do you mean, sir? A rank traitor, Master Bailey, lay hold on him, for he has most erroneously and rebelliously whistled treason. Whistled treason? Alas, sir, how can that be? Very easily, sir. There's a piece of treason that flies up and down this country in the likeness of a ballad. <gasps> and this being the very tune of it thou hast whistled. Alas, sir, you know I speak not a word. That's all one. If any man whistles treason, tis as ill as speaking it. Mark me, Master Bailey, the bird whistles that cannot speak, and yet there be birds in a manner that can speak too. Your raven will call you rascal, your crow will call you knave, Master Bailey. Ergo, he that can whistle can speak, and therefore this fellow hath, spoke, hath, hath both spoke and whistled treason. How say you, Bailey Ignorance? Uh, you have argued well, sir. But, but ye shall hear me shift it, sift him nearer, for I do not think that there are gr but that there are greater heads in this matter. And therefore, my good fellow, be not pestiferous, but say and tell the truth. Who did set you a work? Or who was the cause of your whistling? Or did any man say to you, go, whistle? Uh, not any man, woman, or child, truly, sir. No. How durst you whistle, then? Or what cause had he to do so? Uh, the truth is, sir, I had lost two calves out of my pasture, and being in search for them, from the top of the hill I might spy you two in the bottom here, and took ye for my calves, sir, and that made me come whistling down for joy, and hope I had found them. More treason yet. He takes a courtier and a bailey for two calves to limbo with him. He <gasps> shall be quartered and then hanged. Good Master Bailey be pitiful. Why, Loy, sir, he makes a pitiful fellow of a bailey too. Away with him. Yet stay a while. Here comes your fellow, sir. Now, Master Bailey, are your bears sealed yet? They are, sir. And we have done this day a most strange and pestiferous service, I assure you, sir. Look, I shall be rewarded. Come, fellow Nimble. We must to court about other employments. There are already 13,000 blanks signed and returned to the shrines and 700 sent up to the court for whisperers, out of all which, my lord, will fetch around some, I doubt it not. Come, let's away. Aye, I will follow. Come, ye sheep biter. He is a traitor of all traitors that not only speaks, but has whistled treason. Come, come, sir. I'll spoil your whistle, I warrant ye. Sir, are the bags sealed? Yes, my lord. Then uh, take my keys and lock the money in my study safe. Uh, bar and make sure I charge thee. I so will, my lord. lord. Hmm. So, £7,000 from Bedford, Buckingham, and Oxfordshires. These blanks already have returned the king. So, then there's four for me and uh, three for him. Hmm? Our pains and dismas needs be satisfied. 
Good husbands will make hay while the sun shines, and so must we. For thus conclude these times, so men be rich enough, they're good enough. Let fools make conscience how they get their gold. I'll please the king and keep me in his grace for princes' favours. Purchase land apace. <laughs> These blanks that I have scattered in the realm shall double his revenues to the crown. Now, Lord Tresillian, is this coin come yet? He really wants money. You're too slack, Tresillian. Some shires have sent, and uh, more, my lords, will follow. These sealed blanks I now have turned to bonds, and these shall down to Norfolk presently. The chuffs with more ado have signed and sealed, and here's a secret note my men have sent of all their yearly states amounts unto. And by this note, I justly tax their bonds. Is a fat horson in his russet slops, and yet may spend three hundred pounds by the year, the third of which the hog's face owes the king. Here's his bond for it, with his hand and seal. And so, by this, I'll sort each several sum. The thirds of all shall to King Richard come. How like you this, my lords? Most rare, Tresillian. Hang them, cod's heads. Shall they spend money and King Richard lack it? Are not their lives and lands and living his? Then rack them throughly. Oh, my lords, I have set a trick afoot for ye. And you follow it hard and get the king to sign it, you'll all be kings by it. The farming out of the kingdom, touched Tresillian, tis half granted already, and had been fully concluded had not the messenger returned so unluckily from the Duke of Gloucester, which is a little moved the king at his uncle's stubbornness. But to make all whole, we have left that smooth-faced, flattering green to follow him close, and he'll never leave till he hath done it, I warrant ye. There's no question on it. King Richard will betake himself to a yearly stipend, and we four, by lease, must rent the kingdom. Rent it and rack it, too, ere we forfeit our leases, and we had them once. How now, baggage? What news? All rich and rare. The realm must be divided presently, and we four must farm it. The leases are a making, and for 7,000 pounds a month, the kingdom is our own, boys. <laughs> for, let's differ for no price and it were 70,000 pounds a month and we'll make somebody pay for it where is his highness he will be here presently to seal the writings he's a little angry that the duke comes not but that will vanish quickly on with your soothest faces your wrenching rascals humor him finally and you're all made be by it see See, he comes and that flattering hound green close at his elbows. Come, come, we must all flatter if we mean to live by it. Our uncle will not come then. That was his answer, flat and resolute. <laughs> was ever such a so audacious. And can your grace, my lord, digest these wrongs? Yes, as a mother may beholds that beholds her child dismembered by a bloody tyrant's sword. I tell thee, Bagot, in my heart remains such deep impressions of his churlish taunt as nothing can remove the gall thereof till with his blood mine eyes be satisfied. Sfoot, raise powers, my lord, and fetch him thence perforce. Do not, Green, for while he keeps in the country, there is no meddling. He is so well beloved, as all the realm will rise in arms with him. Sfoot, my lord. And you'd fain have him, I have a trick, shall fetch him from his house at Plashy in spite of all his favourites. Let's have it, Tresillian, thy wit must help, or all's dashed else. Then thus, my lord, whilst the duke securely revels in the country, we'll have some trusty friends 
disguise themselves like maskers and this night ride down to Plashy and in the name of some near adjoining friends offer their sport to make him merry which he no doubt will thankfully accept then in the mask we'll have it so devised the dance being done and the room voided then upon some occasion single the duke alone thrust him in a masking suit clap a visit on his face and so convey him out of the house at pleasure what if he cry and call for help what serves your drumba to drown out his cries and being in a mask twill never be suspected good faith a uh, good if faith and to help it my lord the pool the governor of calais is new come over who with a troop of soldiers closely ambushed in the woods near the house shall shroud themselves till the mask be ended then the duke being attached he shall be there ready to receive him hurry him away to the thames side where a ship shall be laid ready for his coming so clap him under hatches hoist sails and secretly convey him out of the realm to calais and so by this mean you shall prevent all mischief for neither of your uncles nor any of the kingdom shall know what has become of him. I like it well, sweet green, and by my crown we'll be in the mask ourselves, and so shall ye. Get horses ready. This night we'll ride to Plushy. But see, carry it close and secretly, for whilst this plot was working for the duke, I'll set the trap for York and Lancaster. Go, Tresillian, let proclamation straight be sent, wherein thou shalt accuse the dukes of treason, and then attach, condemn, and close imprison them. <laughs> Lest the commons should rebel against us, we'll send unto the king of France for aid, and in requital we'll surrender up our forts of Guisness and Calais to the French. Let crown and kingdom waste, here yeah, life and all, before King Richard see his true friends fall. Give orders our disguises be made ready, and let the pool provide the ship and soldiers. We will not sleep by heaven till we have seen. Where's our suit again? You will forget it else. Oh, these traitors once surprised, then all is sure. Our kingdom quiet and our state secure. Most true, sweet king. And then, your grace, as you promised, farming out the kingdom to us four shall not need to trouble yourself with any business. This old turkey cock Tresillian shall look to the law and will govern the land most rarely. So, sir, the love of thee and these, my dearest green, hath won King Richard to consent to that for which all foreign kings will point at us, and of the meanest subjects of our land we shall be censored strangely when they tell how our great father toiled his royal person spending his blood to purchase towns in France, and we, his son, to ease our wanton youth, become a landlord to this warlike realm, rent out our kingdom like a pelting farm that erst was held as fair as Babylon, the maiden's conquerors of the wall, world. Sfoot, what need you care what the world talks? You still retain the name of king, and if any disturb ye, we four come presently from the four parts of the kingdom with four peasant armies to assist you. Your four must be all then, for I think nobody else will follow you unless you to be hanging. <laughs> Why, Richard, King Richard, will ye be as good as your word and seal the writings? Sfoot, and thou dost not, and I do not join with thine uncles, and turn traitor, would I might be turned to a toadstool. Very well, sir. They did well to choose you for their or orator that has King Richard's love and heart in keeping. Your suit is granted, sir. Let's see the writings. Yeah, here, Lord. You them, Thrasillian? Then we'll sign and seal them. Look to your bargain, Green, and be no loser, for if you forfeit or run behind hand with me, I swear I'll both imprison and punish you soundly. Ooh, forfeit, sweet king. It's blood, I'll sell their houses, I'll, ere I'll forfeit my least, I warrant thee. They be stubborn, do and spare not, rack them soundly, and we'll maintain it. Remember ye not the proviso enacted in our last parliament that no statute, statute, were it ne'er so profitable for the commonwealth, should stand in any force against our proceedings. It is true, my lord, 
Then what should hinder ye to accomplish anything that may best please your kingly spirit to determine? True, Green. And we will do it in spite of them. Is it just, Tresillian? Most just, my liege. Uh, these gentlemen here, Sir Henry Green, Sir Edward Baggett, Sir William Bushy, and Sir Thomas Scroop, all jointly here stand bound to pay your majesty or your deputy, wherever you remain, £7,000 a month for this your kingdom, for which your grace by these writings surrenders to their hands all crown lands, lordships, manors, rents, taxes, subsidies, fifteenths, imposts, foreign customs, staples for the wool, tin, lead, and cloth, all forfeitures of goods and or land confiscate, and all other duties that is shall or may appertain to the king or the crown's revenues. And for non-payment of the sum or sum as aforesaid, uh, your majesty to seize the land and goods of the said gentlemen above named, and their bodies to be imprisoned at your grace's pleasure. Palak, that green. Believe me, if you fail, I'll not favour ye a day. I'll ask no favour at your hands, sir. You shall have your money at your day and then do your worst, sir. It's very good. Set your hands and seals. Zillian, we make you our deputy to receive this money. Look strictly to them, I charge thee. If the money come not to my hands at the time appointed, I'll make them smoke for it. Aye, aye, you're an upright justice, sir. We fear you not. Here, my lord, they're ready. Seen, signed and sealed. Uh, deliver them to his majesty, altogether, as your special deeds. We do with humble thanks unto his majesty that makes us tenants to so rich a lordship. Keep them, Tresillian. Now will we sign and seal to you, never had English subject such a landlord. Ne nor never had English king his subjects as we four that are able to farm a whole kingdom and pay him rent for it. Look that you do. We shall expect the performance speedily. There's your indenture signed and sealed, which as our kingly deed we hear deliver. Thou never didst a better deed in thy life, sweet bully. Thou mayst now live at ease. We'll toil for thee and send thy money in tumbling. We shall see your care, sir. Reach me the map we may all allot their portions, and par the realm among them equally. You four shall here by us divide us uh, yourselves into the thirty-nine shires and counties of my kingdom. But thus come stand by me, and mark those shires assigned ye. Bagot, thy lot betwixt the Thames and the sea thus lies. Kent, Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire, Berkshire, Wilshire, Dorsetshire, Somersetshire, Devonshire, Cornwall, those parts are thine as ample, Begot, as the crown is mine. All thanks, love, duty to my princely sovereign. Bushy, from thee shall stretch his government over these lands that lie in Wales, together with our counts of Gloucester, Worcester, Hereford, Hereford, Shropshire, Staffordshire, and Cheshire. There's thy lot. Thanks to my king that thus hath honoured me. Sir Thomas Croop, from Trent to Tweed, thy lot is parted thus. All Yorkshire, Derbyshire, Lancashire, Cumberland, Westmoreland, and Northumberland. Receive thy lot, thy state and government. With faith and duty to your highness's throne. Now, my green, what have I left for thee? Sfoot, and you'll give me nothing then, good night, landlord. Since you've served me last, and I be not the last shall pay your rent ne'er trust me. I kept thee last to make thy part of thy part the greatest. See here, sweet green, these shires are thine. Even from the Thames to Trent, thou here shalt lie in the middle of my land. <laughs> That's best in the winter. Is there any pretty wenches in my government? Yes, that by this. Thou hast London, Middlesex, Essex, Suffolk, 
Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Northamptonshire, uh, Rutlandshire and Leicestershire, Warwickshire, Huntingtonshire and Lincolnshire. There's your portion, sir. Slid, I will rule like a king amongst them, and thou shalt rule like an emperor over us. Thus have I parted out my whole realm amongst ye. Be careful of your charge and government. And now to touch our stubborn uncles, let warrants be sent down, Tresillian, for Gaunt and York, Surrey and Arundel, while we this night at Plushy suddenly surprise plain Woodstock. Being parted thus, we shall with greater ease arrest and take them. Your places are not sure while they have breath, therefore pursue them hard. Those traitors gone, the staves are broken, people lean upon, and you may guide and rule them at your pleasures. Away to Plushy, let our mask be ready. Beware, plain Thomas, for King Richard comes, resolved with blood to wash all former wrongs. And so we come to the end of this session, and yet people are all preparing for the next scene in that beautiful way that they do. Um, but no, we end on the cliffhanger. Dum dum dum. Richard's coming for Woodstock. It's a big, dramatic final uh, moment there. If you are watching these videos in order and you want to just skip on to the next bit of action, skip on to the next video. And now, uh, Act uh, Four, Scene Two will be starting you sort of skip through our introductions and just carry on with the main action uh, uh but we're going to briefly talk about um our journey through the play uh how we've been finding it today as compared with yesterday for those who are here for both sessions um and uh, just lots of thoughts also in my head the differences between running this uh in our first look sessions as well of, of the the way certain relationships are functioning and you know, all sorts of interesting uh interesting ways um and uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if anyone really wants to leap in first, um, but I, uh, I, I've definitely want to sort of leap in on the relationship between Richard and Green is uh, so much clearer in, uh, in this interpretation. I mean, boy, is Richard being led by his cock um, in that scene. I, 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 that may be simplifying what are uh, quite a complicated scene, but... Um, well, we I, prefer to call it his scepter, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, who's fingering his orb? Uh, uh, anyway, um, that went downhill fast, didn't it? Okay. It's like King Richard. Really Wait, no. scenes we, we, we've got these quite, these are really long, meaty scenes. Um, with the exception of the first one we looked at, which was relatively brief, uh, we have these expanse of a world that's sort of built. And a lot of these scenes are not extending the plot per se, but they really are extending what the characters are doing in that world. And there's some really important things <clears> going on in scenes that are apparently quite empty, but actually some really big uh, work is going on. Uh, so if we work backwards, just that scene here with Richard being persuaded to sell off his kingdom um, and the power play between the various caterpillars as to what they get um and it's like this delayed gratification of what's green going to get at the end and green gets all the really really chunky mm. good uh, good counties uh there does green um good deal for green mm -hmm. thoughts in the room um on 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 richard that scene the minions can uh, i just uh, apologize for the counties i pronounced the name of the countries i pronounced wrong i'm sorry i'm not from this country <laughs> It's, it's yeah, okay. Well, I like them not. now. I, I Google them, but still, you're the king. Uh, you get to pronounce them however you want. Yeah, and some of them are, are deliberately confusing. You know, Hereford, Hartford, etc. Especially if you have to do them relatively close one after the other, uh, they're they're a bastard. Uh, worry you not. Uh, sorry, uh, Francis, then Lois. Yeah, I just can't work Richard out. I mean, why is he? selling off his kingdom in this way i mean and you know why why is he so taken up with superficial fashion and yeah i i just haven't i just can't wrap my head around him as a character i mean he, surely he must know how vulnerable kings are when they do these things you know um, 
it's just you know he's just asking for rebellion so it's just I I just don't understand I need to I need to go on Wikipedia and read about the the real life character I think that, that, that won't uh, this um, is this is early enough that the concept a king could be vulnerable was not yet uh, Helen uh, Helen knows chapter and verse on this I'm just spitballing but but the the concept that a king could be vulnerable basically all the kings since John had done pretty well right H Helen's gonna set me straight Helen is <laughs> no I, I, uh, Lynn was ahead of me but Lois was supposed to be next right? Yeah, the, the, the ordering system sometimes falls apart if we, we sort of get into things. Um, I'll, I'll go to Lois now and then we'll come around uh, there again. Okay, well, I was going to say that Richard in the scene um, seems to know exactly what he's doing, actually. I mean, he keeps telling people, you know, you're going to do this, but if you don't, I, I will really get you. And what he's doing is getting himself an income, isn't it? Uh, I mean, he's getting a, a, a fixed annual income, which they will collect for him. And of course, they will keep a lot of it for themselves. I mean, it's basically how everything works. In fact, I think, I mean, farming things out to somebody else who did the financial stuff. Uh, and of course, was, was pretty corrupt in the process, but then save yourself having to do the work. Yes, he's basically outsourced the kingdom. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're quite used to this in modern government. It always leads to really, really great deals uh, when tendering uh, to private companies. Uh, that's never gone wrong or wasted billions of pounds of taxpayers' money uh, in recent uh, history, very, very recently. That's not at all corrupt. Uh, sorry, uh, Lynn and Helen. Well, right. So as, as Helen was saying, Richard needs ready cash. So he gets cash on the barrel from his minions who then go and act as his agents and they get to keep everything they collect. So the advantage for Richard is he gets immediate money and the advantage for the, the caterpillars is they get more money and, that, and they, they, they do the work as, as um, Lois was saying. So he's lazy and he's undisciplined. He wants the money now. Um, and he he doesn't want to do the work of of collecting taxes. So that's the that's the farming of the realm thing. And the you know, and the question of like how can he not see this is like stupid and dangerous and inviting rebellion? Um, I I know it's 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 dicey to go to history, but um, one interpretation of uh, the historic Richard's behavior is that when he with just sort of chutzpah and personal charisma put down the, the peasants revolt when he was 14 he sort of got it in his head that he really was kind of semi-divine and could do no wrong and was invulnerable he's been king since he was 10 in a way he never is not 10 he never he's a little bit of a case of arrested development that you know nobody has said no to him in his adult life uh and and so he just he, he he kind of really thinks of himself as as different in kind from regular human beings. There's also the sense of he's in a bubble here. You know, he is he has quite deliberately surrounded himself with yes men. People who say no to him are, are have been farm you know left left to go in or, off into their country houses and and, and sit on their hands. Um, and th th those people really rankle on him. You know, he he keeps thinking about the person who said no. To him, um, and and that's uh, the other element that this scene is playing with is Woodstock. You know, he's he's not coming. I gave him an order. Why isn't he here? You know, and 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 uh, you know, the, he's really not a not a happy bunny on that front. Uh, Helen, yeah, Elizabethan tax farming was pretty normal, um, and one of the reasons why it was sometimes the only option was because there wasn't a civil service as we know it. So sometimes the only way of getting out there into the counties, into the shires, to actually raise the money was to sell. I, I, I mean, the, the, the Crown sold its bad debts so that, and people would buy up a, 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 a chunk of bad debt and take a gamble on whether they could collect it or not. Uh, let's, uh, um, it was fairly normal. 
Yeah. Uh, let's uh, go, go back to character within the play. Uh, Richard, how's Richard for you, Valentina? I mean, within this isolated thing, you did you weren't here for yesterday when we were doing no. the acquisition of power, but you've got power now. How 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 are you enjoying your power? I think like it was a bit hard. Like, I mean, it wasn't hard to act. It was I was surprised to actually get quite emotional in the in the last scene um, because I it feels. It feels like a teenager. It feels very impulsive. And at the same time, whatever he thinks he says. I mean, to turn around like and say, well, in front of all these people, like I'm doing what, you know, like I'm doing a shameful thing here is quite strong. Like not all the characters would be able to come out and just do it like, yeah, this is shameful. Like, uh, you know, what, this thing you're asking me to do because I don't have any other choice, basically, but like, and I don't know, it's, it's a very interesting character. It's a bit tantrum centric. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's just like, I don't know. It's like, it's like so many things going on at once. It feels like he's doing the best he can in the situation. Cause at the end of the day, it doesn't really have a choice. I don't know if he realizes it, but it doesn't, if he wants his uncles taken and his money, then he has to agree to this. Um, how are the caterpillars feeling about their roles in this uh, and and uh, and your roles in the play? I mean, we've been horribly rude about you uh, as a continuous thing. Uh, is it justified? How are you feeling about yourselves, Dan, Eliza, or uh, Lynn? Well, we're going to do a great job of of governing our bits of the kingdom. Uh, you know, Richard definitely chose the right people to delegate to, and I don't understand why anyone has a problem with it. How do you feel about each other's shares, by the way? Is there any textual stuff or, the, or how is that feeling for you? There's oh, nothing. I, so go on. Go ahead, Lynn. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I kind of feel like given the, the the way I see these these characters, the three of them, the, the four of them, is that they are 100% self-interested. That's it. That's their, that's basically sort of their moral ground is me, and everybody else can get bent. So I, I think it's inevitable that they're that that they don't none no one of them feels like they're getting enough. Even Green, who gets these very rich um, territories, it's like yeah, that's not really quite fair. I should have more. So you know they they don't even have any loyalty to each other. And I'm sure they're they're jealous of of one another's portion. Dan. I haven't seen any textual evidence of that, but I have no doubt that that's true. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, and uh, I'll come to Francis in just a moment, but uh, just, just also wi widening the scope as well of how uh, how good are they at being corrupt? I mean, we've got wonderful evidence in the text of uh, how Tresillian is very good at being corrupt because we've seen him doing his accounting. And how much is Tresillian uh, leeching off the people above him and the people leech, uh, it, it's just sort of, and the way that that is uh, shown in the, the scene before this, of how they're also leeching down, you know, nimble slightly underneath Tresillian and then working to the people below that. And the, the way that the corruption just leaks everywhere, I find really, really interesting. Thoughts on that in a moment, Francis? Yeah, I thought it was just a very interesting scene because up until this point in the play, um, the Caterpillars have presented a united front and it's it's here that the, the cracks start to show i think and i i think staging this could be you could just very interesting uh uh movement on stage as uh, you know as they all kind of look in and see what the you know the tension you know what's he getting what are what am i getting you know and uh, and i don't you know as Scroob, i definitely have the sort of feeling well i wanted london <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it's, the, it's the paperwork business as well of, you know, and yeah. here we've all got our papers ready about all together simultaneously, uh, these, these moments that come in. Um, going to the scene before with Master Ignorance and, uh, and, uh, and Nimble uh, doing all the work um, and, uh, and, and doing people. Again, it's a very long scene. It's a very expansive scene. In a sense, the point of the scene is... is, is relatively swiftly dealt with but the more you 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 look at it you see actually how clever that scene is 
mm. as it you know you move down to well what is what what is arraignable what what can you get people for well in the end just simply whistling uh, uh it become becomes a crime mm -hmm. uh and that scene is just uh fabulous how was it for everyone uh both as acting these little cameo moments but also people who are there all the way through i mean ignorance and things like that thoughts from the room uh lynn first well I, I, this is a little unformed but um there's there's something really interesting uh and, and i want to say like really kind of brilliant about the fact that you have this comic scene with the uh, you know these tradespeople who are like i don't know nothing about no black chapters you know and uh and and nimble the comic the, the clown character taking advantage of their ignorance and it's like ha 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 isn't that funny uh poor <laughs> poor ignorant but and then the and there's this guy just whistling his way down the road and he gets arrested and um so you know on the one hand you've got oh this is this is comic but on the other hand it's state-sponsored terror the point of this is not that any of these people are really dangerous or traitors the point is to make examples of them and terrorize the population into submission. So you've got those two really different things going on, comedy and, 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 and what we would now call fascism. Mm. Um, yeah, other thoughts? Uh, I mean, ignorance as, as a sort of facilitator, uh, I mean, how, how, how much is ignorance, I mean, by just simply having the name ignorance, you're, you're, you're getting this semi morality tale quality to them. Uh, how ignorant no, I, is ignorance? I read the thing and I just could not get a handle on the guy. And then I decided that he had absolutely no moral sense at all. But for everybody he dobbed in, Nimble was giving him money, which he was spending on bling. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, it was an idea. I don't think it necessarily works, but it was it was the best I could come up with for the poor fellow because I had a great deal of difficulty in finding a character that wasn't just this guy is stupid, which I don't think is interesting. Uh, Alan, I I must admit the when I was listening to it and thinking about it. In some ways, you could actually pay ignorance as Captain Mannering. Pompous ass who's, who thinks he's upwardly mobile. Yeah. Yes, it's not necessarily the stupid, no. the, but he's not fully in on what the, the no. con is, perhaps. I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I, but I'm... these are his neighbours. These are ev He knows every one of these except the whistler. These are his neighbors. These are the people he lives amongst. They're probably the people who elected him to be bailiff. Um, so, and he's, and he knows that they're going to be hanged because after the first one, it's perfectly obvious what's going to happen to them. It's very difficult. Uh, Sarah. I think there might also be an element, I mean, um, Lynn raised the point about fascism, and I think that might be a a point there as well. Like, yeah, partly it could be that he has no moral centre and he wants the money, but I think also he might be just genuinely frightened because, as you said, Helen, like once the first one's gone, um, it's really obvious what's going to happen to them all. So I think maybe the reason he becomes more enthusiastic about doing his job is because it's like, wow, if it doesn't happen to them, it's probably going to happen to me. So that whole thing of like turning on your neighbours, uh, uh, maybe that's a way. Yeah. I just wanted to say about Nimble, I, I honestly, I think he's one of the most repellent characters I've ever played. Um, the, he, and that's saying something, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but, uh, but he's just so, I, I, I love... I love the dynamic of him. I love the way he's written because, you know, you were talking earlier about the caterpillars and then Tresillian's leeching off the caterpillars and then Nimble is leeching off the leech. He is the absolute bottom dweller. He's, he's, he's right there at the bottom of the pecking order. And then in this scene, the dynamic is suddenly turned upside down and all of a sudden he's in charge. 
um, and all these people's fates are at his mercy and he has absolutely no mercy and he 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 absolutely relishes what he's doing you know he really savors frightening these people and and sort of telling them what's going to happen to them or and I, I mean he on the one hand he's yeah he's the clown he's funny but he's the most disturbing clown I, I mean he he he's a really, really repellent character uh, um, and brilliantly written. And I mean, the way this scene functions as a sort of, you know, microcosm of what's going on in the, in the court and in the country. I, I, I just think it's, it's really brilliantly written. It's re it's reminding me very much of the, the, the elements that you get with the true tragedy of Richard the third of the, the way that the corruption just travels just all, all the way down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not explicitly turning to the audience at any moment and going, what are we going to do now? Um, we have just presented you with a moral dilemma. What would you do? Uh, it's not doing that. It's, it's doing something a bit more dynamic, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I think it's also that question of, you know, is using the word you know he's the clown is that a meaningful term to be using with with a character as, as actually quite well developed as this is it's not just there to deliver feed and jokes i i it's, felt that there was a definite when i was playing him i felt there was a definite aspect clown aspect to him there were moments where where i felt he was like yeah the dark hodge like you know the sort of the anti-hodge i mean the, the, there were definitely lines where i i can't think of what they were now but where i felt that there was that aspect to him or at least that tradition was behind him somewhere in the background that clown tradition was behind him but yeah i mean he's absolutely he's far more he's a far more complex character than that he's sort of yeah he's like informed by a clown maybe but he just takes it to a whole new um quite scary level yeah, uh, we'll go to Lynn, then Lois. Yeah, so Nimble is really fascinating. And it's just it <laughs> really one of those, the, the smartest things that this, that this play does is makes him a former schoolmate, former classmate of Tresillian. They used to be social equals. They used to have basically equivalent status. And somehow Tresillian lucked into, lied into failed upward, as we say here, into one of the most powerful and influential um, positions in the country. And Nimble is not um, surprisingly uh, resentful of that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, I think it's, a, it's an ugly truth about human nature that uh, rather than having compassion for people who have also been downtrodden, we often take the first opportunity we have to hurt other people when we've been, when we've been treated unfair. Uh, so, be, you know, that, that impulse to punch down, that's something people do. Mm. Uh, Lois. Yeah, well, I just wondered whether you thought of uh, Nimble as a vice rather than a clown. I mean, he behaves rather like a vice. Later on, he's going to come out speaking in rhyme, and, uh, uh, and the use of rhyme, you know, as indeed in that that scene is, it's one of those things that seems to take it back in a, a direction of an older type of play. It's, uh, it's interesting, as when we first read it, everyone was at the end going, will, will Nimble get away with it? Uh, will he escape? He's going to dob Tresillian in it. And we're all going, boo, Tresillian. Um, so it's slightly interesting to have a slightly different dynamic on that. I need to move us a little bit further forward by going a little bit further back and just talking about the world of Woodstock um, uh, in, in retirement, uh, as it were, uh, all at Plashy and, uh, uh, and, and talking about the state of the kingdom and encountering um this this uh, uh, this uh, uh courtier uh, and i say on first glance it sort of looks like this superfluous scene that you know vaguely reiterates bad things are happening in the kingdom uh king wants to see you um but actually uh, it's, it's it seemed important to me that woodstock has this moment to be actually not that interested in power and just sitting at home and being utterly innocent at this point he, he was very active in the first scenes you know the moment he loses power he's not trying to get power back again he's just going everything's really bad and york lancaster and thomas they say well what do we do well let's just tell everyone to calm down a bit that's all they t they, they plan to do they just try and keep everyone simmering down um 
we have these moments of presaging uh, doom that he's not going to see his brothers again. Uh, and then we get this just glorious sequence with the courtier and the horse, um, of which you know I I, I I love that conversation with the horse. I, I I don't think we quite we quite nailed it, but we we definitely got something out of out of that a um, uh, uh, thing. Thoughts from the room, Francis. Yeah, I just love that moment where uh, Woodstock is alone on stage and he says, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not going to be together again. Um, where yeah yeah he has this uh this portent or uh, i don't know what you call it um but it's just it's just a lovely moment and uh you could do a lot with that on stage i think mm. um yeah and and you yeah, know well done the horse by the way i have to say the horse was very good that was uh, very helpful <laughs> thank actually. you I, I thought the, the horse the horse is genuinely necessary for that scene to work because it is this sort of thing of just going Poor horse. Um, and, and it was that the sadness of the whole thing of going. They beat you more than feed you, don't mm. they? Um, yeah. And just it has a tough horse. time, that horse. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's just, and it's like at the end of that speech, you're just going, "Shall we run away together?" Yeah. That, that's how I thought of that last moment of going. Shall we just? Yeah. Uh, but it's actually not just. Shall I just steal you away? Um, yeah. uh, it's actually shall we run away? Uh, it was quite conspiratorial. Mind. That yeah yeah. yeah. You haven't said you haven't said no. Mm. Let's go, <laughs> and then other people come on stage, and that's sort of how I see it. It's almost like Woodstock could have escaped with a horse, and we could have had a series about Woodstock and his horse yeah. uh, riding through the kingdom, pretend you know, being plain Thomas, and yeah. sadly the courtier comes <clears throat> back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the name uh, of Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lois. I thought I saw a hand. Um, yeah. Well, I love that scene too. Um, yeah, one thing I was wondering about, actually, if one tried to stage it, I suddenly was thinking, you know, what um, what a pity we can't have the courtier wearing this extraordinary long-toed shoe that's then attached to his knee with a, a chain. But I can't figure out is how, if he's dressed like that, he can ever get on or off that horse, though. <laughs> how would you do it? I, I don't think they have stirrups yet at this point, um, although I'm not sure when the stirrup, uh, when the stirrup is invented. They, they have stirrups. Once more, Helen with the truthiness. Well, and okay, with the okay, 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 no, okay. No one listen yeah, to me do. ever, guys. No, 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 no. I think they have stirrups. It's, it's, I, I, I mean, I'm, I tend to think of this play as set in the early, in the, in the 16th century. And instead of setting it in its proper time. So ignore 90% of what I say, unless I'm talking, because I'm talking entirely, I live in the 16th century. Well, that, that's a good place to live. Um, in reality, rather than in theater, you would wear boots to ride rather than your nice court shoes, I think. The shoes just have to be on stage so Woodstock can make a joke about them. Well, that's oh. the thing is, is if he doesn't want to get off the horse because he will get them muddy because they're cl cl clearly not practical. Everything about this man has to be completely unpractical. Uh, and that's what's so delightful is he may not he may only be able to ride in this costume and not actually walk properly. Uh, or vice versa you know it, it, it this there needs to be because it's just the, the the way Woodstock just goes and that chain connecting your toes to your, your knee um, yeah um, so the, there's so much potential I mean this is this is down to the, the costume and the, uh, the, the, the the production side of things um, it's just so full of potential. Uh, other thoughts, uh, Lynn? Yeah, I was just going back to, you know, Wood, the character of Woodstock and what's this scene doing here. I, I feel like that the, the writer judged accurately that after the confrontation between Richard and his uncle at court, Woodstock's character maybe needs a little rehabilitating with the audience. He, not everything he did in that court scene seemed wise or kind or justified. Uh, so um, here in his own environment, outside the court, we see him at his at his humorous, compassionate, um, humble best, and and I, that's one of the the things that this scene does is it generates a lot of compassion for that character. 
Mm. There's, there's, there's a real sense of this little oasis of calm that the storm is of this play is orbiting. We we have the storm before, we have the storm afterwards, and this this just makes it everything that follows worse. I think that's important. Is that you were talking about? You know, rehabilitating him. It really you've got to got to get in the situation that what happens is about to happen to Thomas Woodstock. Spoilers, people. He dies horribly and very slowly, um, which we're about to discuss. Um, or when we go off camera. Um, is, you know, how cruel and unnecessary it all is. Actually, he's actually fairly content to just sit in the country and do bugger all. Um, and it's just, he said no. He said no, didn't he? Uh, any additional thoughts about the play? We, I haven't quite gone. Uh, we've had the last appearance of Queen Anne, uh, uh, who sadly had to uh, leave the room uh, early. Um, uh, and so that's the last time we're going to be seeing that character. Uh, and the other business has been going on. We haven't really talked very much about Tresillian, actually. We've talked about everything around Tresillian. Tresillian is just very efficient. Um, I'm, I'm liking that. Um, the way that Tresillian's in that court scene at the beginning of this session um, and just going, it's all legal. Honest, look, I've got this paper. Uh, and actually doesn't need to say very much. Is just there quietly, efficiently getting on with extracting money and power. Yeah, he's a great facilitator, and it sucks that we don't know what happens to him in the end, um, because it would be really interesting, however it goes, it would be an interesting sort of um, development from what we've seen him do. Because yes, all he does is make things work for the people he can get money out of, without putting himself in danger, without giving himself much power, which is, you know, really clever, until it stops working. It... <laughs> He, he refuses to shave his beard to keep up with the fashions, though. <laughs> that must be his undoing. <laughs> be it. <laughs> um, He's detached. I, I, I mean, this is the not shaving of the beard. He's very detached from the others. Mm. He sees them for what they are very clearly. I think he sees the political situation he sees the king, he sees the uncles, he, he is able to understand what other people's motives are. Oh. I'd... Yeah, and he's definitely not an inner circle member and he's older than, than all of the caterpillars and he, do, he isn't among them in terms of rank and yeah, you're, you're absolutely uh, right. Because of the way the, the nation has been farmed, He's got their lives in his hand. Mm, because if he one. can show that they've been defaulting, he's got them. Mm. And if they want a little extra time, he's the one they have to come to. Very Henry, Henry the Seventh, that isn't it? Um, uh, Francis. Yeah, I just get the feeling Tresillian's a very canny operator. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't, um, I've yet to read the rest of the play, but I, I get this sense that he's a survivor uh, because he is detached and because he uh, bends and sways with the prevailing wind, as it were. Mm. It, it, uh, Alexandra. And also, I've just realized he is, uh, he's the one who comes up with all the ideas. Um, so he says to the caterpillars, I have a device to put you in charge to make you all kings. He says to the king, um, I have an idea of how you can get Woodstock back and, and uh, elaborates on that on that plan. So, yeah, he's he's not only very clever, but his kind of he's a plot mover without putting himself in at, at risk as much as he puts everybody else. Yeah. I, I just want to close uh, uh, discussion uh, just briefly by uh, uh, mentioning uh, one of the characters we haven't really discussed very much. Uh, we could, we, we have skipped through quite a few, but uh, just briefly just to uh, mention, you know, we said, uh, Lois said yesterday, you know, Cheney is the only nice person, uh, you know, truly um, <laughs> just this ni nice person, useful person who's always there, um, delivers messages, um, and is this sort of constant, interesting constant presence, actually. I mean, Cheney didn't do very much. <laughs> Um, but he's there actually, he's, he's, he's about, um, I, I, and considering where Cheney was earlier, just there's, there's an interesting, the use of even minor characters of having some continuity through. Um, 
Yes, I, I found him quite interesting, actually. Which it's really odd when we get to the, the final scenes. I mean, he seems to be practically running the battle and I don't know how he got into that position, uh, but he seems to be quite important anyway. I mean, he's obviously got a background, a military background. Uh, mm. uh, you know, we, it's this middle section we don't have, for example, the Earl of Arundel, uh, you know, the Lord Admiral of England, um, who will reappear uh, next session. Um, so it's interesting where there is continuity and there is discontinuity as to what these uh, other roles do. Uh, I mean, Cheney is very much on the side of the uncles, uh, whereas uh, Arundel, not 100% certain where, probably, but not quite so sure. Um, you know, it's, just, uh, it's, it's interesting how these different uh, levels play around. Um, anyone got any final desperate last, last words before I close the session and we go, to plan tomorrow no thank you very much then to all the readers for another lovely session in this world of thomas of woodstock all that remains to say goodbye bye, bye.